We're going to be in John chapter 16. Two months ago, we began studying Jesus' farewell address to his disciples, so it's been a while. We began that in chapter 13. Um, Today, we're going to wrap up the formal teaching portion of um, his farewell address, which has um, been recorded up until this point from 13 to 16, um, before Jesus launches into the prayer portion, which is recorded in chapter 17, and we'll take a few weeks in that as well. So this section today ends the instruction. It ends the formal teaching that Jesus is giving his disciples. And so today I want to begin with the ending. I want to take us to the very last verse, verse 33, and we'll launch from there. Look at verse 33 of our passage today. These things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus, once again, mentions the uh, reality of living in this world. Uh, Remember, the word world doesn't refer to the planet, right? But it refers to, rather, the evil world system. John always uses uses this word to describe the world because it's dominated by sin. Satan is the ruler of this world. His evil influence energizes the world, sinful people in the world, Uh, pursue sinful desires. It's full of men who loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil, as Jesus said back in John chapter 3. And these men who practice evil, according to Jesus' words in chapter 3, verse 20, hate the light. The verse says, for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. So, Those that live in the world, the evil of this world, hate the light. This is what basically Jesus has been talking about in our passage. Um, And they hate it because their deeds are evil. And they don't want their deeds to be exposed as such. Conversely, those who do truth um, come to the light. In verse 21 of chapter 3, But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. And this is the great battle between, between truth and evil, uh, between light and darkness. Um, that's the reality of the world we live in. We live in the midst of a world at war. Even in peacetime between many nations, it's a world at war, and it's a war against the truth. Our postmodern world uh, used to have two divisions of, of truth. Uh, it used to be that there was the world of facts. Uh, those were the objective, um, you know, public knowledge uh, things that, that's binding on all, that they're verifiable, they're rational. So uh, science, right, that was one of those things, at least according to the world, uh, objectionable, verifiable. Uh, history, human reason, all, all those things, right? But then they took and they, had, they created another world, right, a world of values, and that was sort of the private um, subjective matters that are your personal preference. Those aren't necessarily verifiable, Uh, nor do they have to be rational. And what's in that category? Religion, right? Morality, those kind of things. And that's how the world used to be. It had these two great uh, divisions, and that is the the way the world battled against absolute truth. And in trying to battle against absolute truth, uh, it has now embraced absolute chaos. We no longer have that that world where even the things that were uh, um, sort of public knowledge and verifiable and irrational, no longer does that really exist, right? Now it's pretty much whatever you want to believe. Uh, If you want to believe you're something other than you are, uh, believe it. It doesn't matter how long we believe something else, how how that goes against science, biology, how irrational that is, right? We've, we've We've gotten rid of that, so our world isn't a world of chaos. We've, we, we've, we've gone away from absolute truth completely to embrace absolute chaos. And we shouldn't be surprised. Jesus promised the disciples um, the world would hate them because it, it hated uh, me before it hated you, he said uh, recently. Um, and the reason is because it hates the light. It hates those who love the truth and go toward the light. And he promised them that persecution would come. Um, and here in verse 33 of our passage, he promises, well, a new word, tribulation. Tribulation, the word is thelipsis, and it means pressure or distress or uh, affliction. You are going to feel the pressure from the world. 
You're going to be afflicted. You're going to feel distressed. Uh, that's what wartime is like. I, I don't know many soldiers that I've talked to that said, oh yeah, it was just fun and games. <laughs> yeah, well, we just sat around and had fun. It was peaceful. No, it's, it's distressing. <laughs> you feel the pressure of it. That's the mindset of wartime. And the world is at war against the very things you hold dear, the things you know to be true, absolute truth. And Paul acknowledged this to the, uh, the Christians that were in Thessalonica. In, in chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, verse, uh, chapter 3, I'm sorry, uh, verse 3, he said that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened and you know. We, when we were with you, we told you what happened and it happened and you know it and you know it and you're in the midst of it. You're pointed uh, to this. Peter similarly says in chapter 5 verse 8, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. He doesn't tell them to avoid it, to, to run from it. He says, your brothers are experiencing the same thing. They should expect that because they're truth seekers. They hold fast to the truth. They love uh, the light. And so, Jesus has been preparing the disciples for this. This is the way of life. This is the way of life for you, right? He's been very open uh, about it. And it's the way of life for us. And so what Jesus does here is he offers these great words of encouragement. I think these are so incredibly profound. He says, be of good cheer. <laughs> cheer up. That, that, that's his encouraging words. Cheer up. Maybe some of you have, have a, a different translation. It says, take courage. So be brave. Now, if I were meeting with you one-on-one -on -one, and you were telling me about all the distresses and the tribulations you're going through, and I said, cheer up, you'd punch me in the face. <laughs> that, that, what is that going to do, right? Cheer up. This stinks. I hate it. It's difficult. I'm in distress. I'm anxious. I'm in pain. Cheer up. You cheer up. Pow, right? <laughs> it just seems like a weak Thing to say, but that's what Jesus says. Cheer up. Be brave. Take courage. I think the difference is this it's Jesus is saying it. If I said it, what does that even mean? All right? But Jesus says it. In fact, it's not a phrase, it's a one word word. It's tharseo. It's used only eight times in the New Testament, and guess who uses it? every single time? Jesus. It's his own word. It's his own way of encouraging those who love him, encouraging those who love the truth, encouraging those who follow him. That makes a difference, doesn't it? Doesn't it make a difference that Jesus is the one that says it? Because it should. It should. And it's an imperative. It's a command to us. He commands all believers throughout all of human history, everywhere, to take courage, to cheer up. And we can truly take those words to heart today because of what Jesus tells us in this passage. So that's why I've started at the end. We're going to um, read the passage and we're going to pull out of it why. Why can we take courage? Why can we take those words from Jesus, cheer up, and how can they really mean something to us? Let's look at our passage today. It's verses 25 to 33. These things I've spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father." His disciples said to him, See, now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? 
Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet, I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. What a great passage today. We'll look back at verse 25, and we'll start there. These things I've spoken to you in figurative language, but the time's coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I'll, I'll speak plainly to you. What is Jesus talking about uh, here? Well, he certainly has spoken um, in a way that's been difficult for the disciples to understand, right? They've failed to understand him on many, many occasions. In fact, he says, these things I've spoken to you in figurative language. What are the things? I mean, is it just, uh, is it just the passage prior to this? Uh, is it just... Uh, this night that he's been with the disciples? I would say no. I think it's the entire three and a half years he's been with them. All these things he's been speaking to them in figurative language, everything. All throughout the Gospels, you you see this. You might remember Jesus spoke about um, it's not what goes into a mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of his mouth. And what does Peter say? In Matthew chapter 15, verse 15, Peter answered him and said to him, explain this parable to us. And so Jesus said, are you still without understanding? They didn't get it, right? Even the simplest of things, they didn't understand. On another occasion, the disciples, uh, they crossed over the Sea of Galilee, and they forgot to bring along the bread. Do you remember that? And this caused them to misunderstand another statement by Jesus. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they hear the word leaven, and they go, oh, it's because we didn't bring the bread. We forgot to bring the bread. That's what he's talking about. It's about the bread. (laughs) And Jesus, in Matthew 16, verse 8, corrects their thinking. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O you of what faith? Little. Little faith. Why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up, nor the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up? How is it you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Confused and not getting it at all. Even here in John's gospel, we've seen it several uh, times. Remember, Jesus said, destroy this temple, right? Destroy this temple and in three days I'll... I'll raise it up. We're told the disciples didn't get it, that they didn't understand that Jesus wasn't talking about the actual physical temple, but about his body, and they wouldn't understand until after the resurrection. John records it in chapter 2, verse 22. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. They didn't get it then, but after the resurrection, John notes, but then they got it. They didn't understand even most recently the significance of the triumphal entry of Jesus. John makes another note about that in chapter 12, verse 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Even most recently in our chapter, um, here chapter 16, last week, we see this in verse 17. Then some of his disciples said among themselves, what is this that he says to us? (laughs) A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the father, they were confused. They just just didn't understand. Ultimately, they failed to understand because Jesus had been speaking to them in figurative language. It's peroimia. It's a proverb. It's a metaphor. It's a, um, in fact, it's better than a proverb. In fact, I think figurative language is the best meaning because it's a, it has a meaning, it has a pointed meaning, but a, it's veiled. It's a pointed but veiled statement. Uh, Jesus had said things like, I'm the bread, right? I'm the light. I'm the water. I'm the temple. Uh, you need to eat my flesh. You need to drink my blood. All of those things have pointed truths in them, but they're veiled, aren't they? They're confusing. Um, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you'll follow me afterward. I mean, all these things, veiled truths. But he says, the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. What time is that? Well, we should know by now what time it is. It's when the Holy Spirit comes and reveals 
truth. Just a quick, brief review because we spent a lot of time looking at this. Look at chapter 14, verse 17. Jesus first mentions the Spirit as the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. It's very important. The helper I'm sending is going to be in you, with you. The world won't have this. It's something the world won't have, but you will. I'm giving you an advantage, he says later on, right? It's to your advantage that I go away because you'll have the advantage of the helper, the spirit of truth. In chapter 15, verse 26, he says this about it. But when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. He'll be the one to, well, bring, bring to their remembrance everything. That's why the disciples, after Jesus' glorification, remembered what the triumphal entry meant, remembered what Jesus meant by destroy this temple, because the Holy Spirit came and revealed those spiritual truths to them. In chapter 16, verse 13, he says this, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority But whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. That's what Jesus has been talking about. And at that time, when the Holy Spirit comes, he'll speak plainly and openly and freely and without ambiguity about the Father. That's what he says. I will tell you plainly about the Father. Everything that Jesus has said, his entire testimony has been to reveal the Father, hasn't it? That's that's been why Jesus is here. He who has seen me has seen the Father. I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. Believe me that I am in my Father and the Father in me. All throughout this passage and all throughout the the entire Gospel of John, it's been about the Father. And while he had spoken to them about the Father and what he spoke had truth to it, it was veiled. It was veiled. It was sort of hidden to them. But with the coming of the Holy Spirit, Get this, the veil would be lifted. It's going to be lifted. I'll speak plainly to you in that time. Now think about this. You get through the Gospels, and guess what you don't see anymore? You don't see Proverbs. You don't see figurative language about the Father. You have very direct, right, statements, theology, right? Not hidden, truth, given to us. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in the lives of the uh, apostles, as they wrote down, carried along by the Holy Spirit, made those things absolutely clear for you. Why, why uh, would they write this thing down for you so that it's only veiled to you? That's not what Jesus said. There's going to be a time coming when it's plain. Why? He wants them to understand. He wants them to know truth. And that's the point that Jesus is getting to. With the coming of the Holy Spirit, there's absolute clarity. Absolute clarity. The disciples will see the Father clearly, and they will have direct access to him. And this is going to be point number one. I'm going to take you through four points. But when you kind of look at the question of how can we uh, take courage, how can we cheer up in the, the midst of a hostile world, when the Holy Spirit comes, um, we, something changes for us. The, the church age is unique because, one, we have direct access to the Father. We have direct access to the Father. And that's what he says in verse 26. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. In that day, in that time that is coming that he mentioned earlier, you will ask in my name. And I don't say to you that you shall pray the Father for you. What does Jesus mean here? Well, in that day you're going to get to ask the Father personally. I won't need to go and ask on your behalf, Jesus is saying. I won't go to the Father for you. You'll go to the Father for you. In that day, you get to do it personally. That's how the relationship worked then up until now. They had to go to Jesus. If the disciples needed anything, they went to Jesus. And then we see Jesus. There's, there's many hours recorded where he just goes off and he prays, right? Alone. Who's he praying for? Himself, for his disciples. But with the coming of the Holy Spirit, that's all going to change. You have direct access to the Father. And he already said this in verse 23. Look what he said back in verse 23. In that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. We won't ask Jesus anything because he won't 
be here physically. We'll know of his presence because of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, but he won't be here. But also, we'll be able to ask the Father directly because we have direct access to him. And you have to remember, this would have been a completely foreign concept that Jesus is establishing for those disciples, right? Jews did not communicate to God as their father in the same intimate way that Jesus has been doing. Sure, he's the father of, you know, the Israel nation, but, you know, they, they didn't address him the same way that Jesus seemed to be with this sort of friendliness and intimacy. God is distant. He's unreachable. Only the high priest would ever approach him in the Holy of Holies, and that once a year, right? He's just this unapproachable being. But here he's telling them that they will have that same intimate relationship that he has. They'll get to approach him directly. Why? Well, because upon his death, and you guys all know this, something happened to the veil of the temple. What happened to it? It was torn from top to bottom. It was split. Not only was the veil torn to say, listen, you have direct access to God, but it ties into what Jesus is saying. You'll have clarity. You'll know who you... There's no more veiled figurative language. You have clear um, um, teaching of who the Father is, and you have clear direct access to Him. And Jesus secured that through His death. The veil has been lifted. And as Jesus has said on multiple occasions, now they'll ask in his name. He said that in verse 24 as well. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. They never needed to, right? Because Jesus was with them. But he says, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Now you can go to the Father and you can ask in my name and you will receive and that will bring you joy. That's what he's saying. We can approach God directly because we know Jesus. We go to him and we go, we know Jesus. That's why we can approach him in his name. We can come to him that way. And when we pray according to the will of Christ to accomplish the mission of Christ for the glory of Christ, the Father responds. Now, one note of clarity. Someone here might be thinking about certain scriptures that speak of Jesus interceding for us. You say, yes, we can go directly to the Father, but doesn't Jesus still pray for us? Doesn't he intercede for us? Yes, he does. And I want to take a look at one of those. It's Romans 8. 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. While we have direct access to the Father, Jesus remains at his side and he maintains an intercessory work in overcoming a believer's sin. That's what Jesus' role here. It's his high priestly role. He's our high priest, right? And that's what the book of Hebrews is really about. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16, this is what it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can come to the throne of grace because of Jesus. And he's constantly there interceding on my behalf because the accuser wants to accuse you. The accuser wants to tell you, you can't approach. You're still too sinful. You're just not worthy enough. This is God after all. You're just muck. You're just some slime that crawled out of the ooze of this world, right? That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to destroy Genesis and say, you don't really have any, you're just, you're just a cosmic accident. But no, you're created in his image and you've been saved by Christ and now he is your advocate and you can approach him. And that's why John tells us in 1 John 2, 1, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Jesus is there. He's our advocate. He says, Yeah, I know he messed up, but um, he's covered by my blood. He has my righteousness. he's, He's constantly there to intercede on my behalf so that I can constantly have free access to him. So that's Jesus's role. It's his high priestly role. But it doesn't negate the fact that you have free access to the Father directly. Now, why? Why do you have access? And this is what Jesus is doing. He's grounding them. This is point number two. Why do you have access? Because we have the love of the Father. Second part of verse 27. For the Father himself, or first part of it, sorry, for the Father himself loves you, right? So 
in that day, you'll be able to ask in my name and I, I won't you know, be praying to the Father for you. You'll get to do it directly. Why? For the Father himself loves you. Now, the word here for love is not agape. It's not that sacrificial love of the will. It's not agapao. The word is phileo. That's a deep, caring affection. That's the love that is used to describe the love a father has for his children. That's the word used here. Now, yes, God loves sinners in a general sense, right? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. That's the agapao. That's the sacrificial love of the will. But the word here is phileo. What's the point? God the Father loves you with a deep, caring love, and he lavishes that love upon you. You're his child, and he loves you. And that's why you have access to him. You should always have free access to the Father, right? With no hint of of judgment. I now have a study in my house. It's wonderful to have a study. It's wonderful to be able to go away and have a place of my own to study. But at the back of the study is the laundry room. So naturally, I have to keep access to the laundry room for them. That's going to happen in and out, right? But there are times where I'm in that study mode, And my little boy will come in because he's a cuddler and he wants to come in and he just wants to come in and hug and give a little kiss, right? But I'm in study mode. And sometimes it's like, what are you doing? (laughs) But I I don't want that, uh, my son. I want him to know he always has direct access to me and to know that he has his father's love, right? He, he turned around, he came in, he saw we was studying and I could tell he was really quiet and he kind of turned around, he started walking back out. And I turned around, I said, Tayden, come here. And I brought him over, and I just gave him a hug. I want him to know that he has access to the Father, right? You have access to the Father. Why? Because he loves you. He loves you. Yes, he is cute. I hear you guys stop it. (laughs) He loves you. Romans 8, 15 to 16. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage, again, to fear. That's not the spirit you have. But you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Here's one of the things the Spirit does for you. The Spirit tells you, yes, you are his child. Yes, you can call him Papa, right? Jesus is saying this. The time is going to come when I'm going to speak to you plainly. Plainly, you will understand things like this. He is your Papa. He's your daddy. You can go to him. You can go to him directly. You have free access to him, and he loves you. Last week, we had those Israelis uh, that were here. Um, If you missed that, it was a great great opportunity to, to just get a new perspective, but they were here through a ministry called Tikva. Uh, after serving in the IDF, they a lot of times don't know what to do with their lives. They don't know where to go. And so uh, Jeff has started this ministry to kind of give them a place to discipleship and kind of ground them and, and maybe point them in the right direction. Uh, we brought them all back to our house. Jody had to cook for 22 people, right? And we were out in a big circle out there, and they wanted to hear our testimony, which we gave rather quickly because we wanted to hear theirs. I was like, forget about me. I got it easy. Let me hear about you. And we went around a circle, and all of them, except for one, were, grew, grew up in Christian homes. They, they, they grew up understanding who he was and who Christ was, and, right? but they had those challenges in their faith like young people do, and finally had to make the, their faith their own. But there was one uh, that didn't, had a really difficult background, a uh, really difficult childhood. Guess what that person said finally turned them to the gospel? One word, love. His love really spoke to me. The love of the gospel really spoke that I have a father who loves me. That, that's what she said. The love of the father is supposed to speak that, that you have free access to him and he loves you greatly. He loves you dearly. In this world of instability, hostility, uh, devoid of absolute truth, utter chaos, what people want is real love. Non-believers should see in us this and desire it for themselves, this love, the love the father has for his own, is an absolute guarantee. There's an absolute truth you want to sink your teeth into. Absolutely true, the Father loves you. Absolutely true. Don't let the devil deceive you in that area. Now, here's the question. How is it possible? Right? How is that even possible that we could have the love of the the Father because of our faith and obedience? And that's what is spoken of here in the second half of verse 27. So he says, the Father lo- himself loves you because you have loved me and I believe that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father, I've come into the world, and again I leave the world and go to the Father. 
If someone were to see that love in you today and ask you, how can I have that love of the Father? What would you say? What would your answer be? I hope it would be, love his son. I hope it would be, you got to love Christ. It's all about Christ. We love Christ, therefore we have the love of the Father. That's what is, is being said uh, here. I remember very sadly, I have a, a long history of, of Christianity in my family, right? I was at my fa- grandfather's funeral, and uh, my uncle, his son, was up there sharing, and it came out in his testimony that we were a Christian family, but there were non-believers, there were people there, um, and I remember I overheard this conversation. They came up to them and said, okay, so you're Christians. What is that? What is the Christian? What is it about? Is it like rules and things? You, oh, yes, it's definitely, it's definitely rules and things that you have to follow. That was their answer. I would never have said that. I would have said, it's a relationship with the one who wants to have a relationship with you. It's a love of Christ. It's a relationship. And because I love him, guess what? I have the love of the Father. All right, that should have been the answer. It's not, oh, well, here, hope you can follow all these rules. Who wants that? That's not what it's based on. But notice, Jesus says, the reason the Father loves you is because you have loved me. How do we demonstrate love for Christ? It is through our obedience to him, isn't it? We've seen that. In John chapter 14, most recently, verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Again, in verse 23 and and 24, Jesus mentioned it. Jesus answered and said to them, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Again, in, in chapter 15, verse 10, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. So you might, by looking at these verses and looking at what is said here, the Father Himself loves you because you've loved me, and we translate love as obedience, you might go, well, okay, then it is about a bunch of rules, right? It is only about following that. No, no, no. Which comes first, the faith or the obedience? I have to have faith in Him first, right? I have to know who it is I'm loving, when I know the truth of the gospel, that's what makes me go, boom, oh, I get it. And I want to I I obey him. I want to do whatever he says. That's real love, isn't it? Obedience is the second step. Faith is the first. John's written this gospel to dispel any and all theories and myths related to the identity and person of Jesus. He is God. That's why he's written this, right? Faith in Jesus is to believe these things that he just wrote, that he came from the Father, that he came into the world, that he's returning to the Father. That's the entire incarnation, isn't it? That's the whole thing. And Jesus warned over and over and over again that faith or belief in him as the Christ, as the one sent into the world by the Father, was absolutely necessary for salvation. Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. We must believe in who he is and what he's done. And that in turn causes us to want to obey him. It produces obedience. But Jesus is warned over and over again that we must, it, we can only come to the father through him. In John chapter eight, verse 23, and he said to them, you are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I'm not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I'm he, you will die in your sins. John calls those who don't believe in Jesus, he calls them liars and antichrists. Those are harsh words, but that's what he calls them in 1 John 2, 22. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. You must acknowledge Christ. You must come to faith in him that he came from God. He came into this world, not that he just came here and visited, right? But he he, he came here and did what he came to do, right? That he died for the sins of mankind. And after that mission accomplished, he returned to the Father. You must believe those things. Esther was talking about studying the other religions of this world. I remember having a talk with some Mormons over a course of several weeks and obviously they have uh, their own set of scriptures. They got the Pearl of Great Price, right? They got all these different 
uh, things in it. And um, it doesn't matter if you present them with the facts of who Joseph Smith was, uh, that the Egyptian papyrus that he translated from is actually uh, an Egyptian burial. You know, we've translated, we know what it is. It's not the Pearl of Great Price. It doesn't matter about those facts. They will say to you, the Holy Spirit testifies to the truth of those things, right? As we just read, the, the Holy Spirit testifies that these are true. And I would go to them and say, well, it's funny because the Holy Spirit testifies to me that these are true. So we're both testifying about the Holy Spirit. One of us is wrong, right? And they would go, oh, you agree. Yeah, we agree. One of us is wrong. Where do you go with that? Well, you go to the Holy Spirit tests that I went to a few weeks back in 1 John, right? You have to believe in a divine Christ, a divine life, and a divine law. Joseph Smith, none of those things. I'm going to make my own Christ, right? In fact, for the Christians that got duped into that, it should have been really, really obvious. You just look through those three tests. For us, we have to uh, believe in the divine Christ. And that causes um, faith, it causes obedience. The Jews of this day, they didn't believe in him that way, did they? No, he's got a demon. Uh, No, he's a madman. No, worse, he's a Samaritan. Remember all those things they were calling him? But the disciples, what about them? What do they believe about Jesus? You might remember in John chapter 6, verse 69, Peter says, also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, right? Pretty amazing confession. Right here, you have a very similar confession in our passage today. Look at verse 29. His disciples said to him, See, now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this, we believe that you came forth from God. These simple truths, the way Jesus is presenting these things, are are plain to us. To know that the love of the Father comes to us through faith in his son, is the gospel. And it's simple enough for a child to grasp. It really is. It's not complicated. And so now the disciples are responding as if long last, they're beginning to understand, right? And look at what they confess. They confess his omniscience. You know all things, right? They're confessing in his divinity, in his divine origin. You came forth from God. They're they're beginning to get it. In fact, one commentator wrote this, about them. The light is shining brightly now, more brightly perhaps than ever before. Within a few hours, it will be obscured once more. Yet the confession which is here made will linger on in the realm of the subconscious until by and by when the Lord arises in triumph from the tomb and a little later pours out his spirit, it will bear the fruit of calm and steadfast assurance. And this fruit will abide forever. I love that. That just ties the whole passage together. That's what's going to happen. The Spirit's going to come and it's going to cement that and cause that fruit to remain absolutely forever. Forever. But notice what Jesus says in response to them in verse 30, 31. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. Yes, uh, firstly, I think Jesus is not questioning the validity, validity of their faith. I think earlier on you saw, oh, you have little faith. I think he's speaking about, you know, more of the, the lack of maturity that's, that's there still because the Holy Spirit has not come. And in just a few short hours, they will forsake him. They will scatter uh, him, you know, fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 13. They're going to leave him alone. But While they leave him alone, Jesus makes a very important statement here. He won't truly be alone. Why? And yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. Do you see what Jesus is doing? What you said is great. You're getting it. You're you're understanding here, right? But you're going to leave me alone. But I want you to know that doesn't shake me. That doesn't rattle me. Why? Because I have the Father's love. He is with me. And he wants them to know the same about them. Why? They're going to be alone, aren't they? They're going to go through it. They're going to be ostracized. They're going to be abandoned by loved ones. People will desert them. And in the midst of that loneliness, they will feel the presence of the Father because he loves them through their faith in Jesus, through their belief in him. He's saying to them this, your faith is the real thing. I don't think he's discouraging them. I don't. Your faith is the real thing. It's real. And we have to be reminded of that as well. That's all you need. This is all that he's he's giving giving us the most simple thing, isn't it? It's just the gospel. What's going to get you through the hard time? How can you take Jesus' words, oh, take courage, to heart? Because the Father loves you. He loves you because you love his son. That's an incredible truth. 
What, what, else, what else do you need? You need nothing more. But he gives us one more. He gives us one final reason why the disciples should take courage. And it's because of the hope that comes through Christ. It's the hope that comes through Christ. Look at verse 33 again. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And we talked about the first part of this at the beginning, but he says, I've overcome the world. Overcome is nikao. It means to conquer or to prevail over. Jesus has conquered the world. It's a past tense. He has conquered it. He has prevailed over it. Now, this hasn't been completely fulfilled in our time. We don't look at around at the world and go, yeah, Jesus has completely conquered this, right? Sin isn't running amok at all, <laughs> right? But he has conquered it. It's all been worked out in eternity, in eternity. He conquered sin. He conquered the evil world system. He conquered death. He conquered Satan. And because we are in Christ, because of the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, we too are overcomers. Kimber read this passage earlier, but I just want to focus in on the two verses that mention this in 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 to 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That's pretty simple, isn't it? That's pretty basic. Cheer up. Why? Because you believe in me. Because you believe in me, the Father loves you. Oh, because the Father loves you, you have free access to him. Right? That's, that's it. And because all those things are true, and I'm going to die on the cross, I've overcome it all. Right? I've conquered it all. That's why Paul talks to us in, in ways that to, to draw that truth to the forefront that we have already triumphed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, he says, Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. We should be walking around on this earth uh, triumphant Christians. And the fragrance of the knowledge of that truth should permeate this world triumphant, not defeated, not depressed, not distressed, triumphant. And that's real hope, isn't it? It doesn't matter what the world does, we win. <laughs> and what we see today, I don't know if you, know, you spotted it, but we've seen the great Christian triad of, of virtues today, haven't we? We see love, the Father loves you. We've seen faith, our faith in Christ, and we've seen hope, right? Paul tells us those, those three abide in, right? And of those three, love is the greatest, he tells us in 1 Corinthians 13. But in 1 Thessalonians, the church that was suffering, and we read at the beginning, in chapter 5, verse 8, he says this, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Three simple words, faith, love, and hope. But that's, those are the words Jesus uses today. He says, those are the things you stand upon that you can take courage in. I can say to you, cheer up, because of the love the Father has for you, because of your faith in me, and because of the hope of eternity and salvation because I've overcome the world. We have direct access to the Father. We have the love of the Father. We have faith in His Son. And we've overcome the world through Christ, which gives us real hope. This is a hope that the world does not have, is it? This uncertainty over the future, the world is caught up in anxieties over uh, climate change, <laughs> leadership change, uh, changes in advances to technology and AI, and there's, a, there's a, a bevy of things you can be anxious about today. But the believer has no such anxiety, for he rests in the arms of a loving God who has overcome the world. Be encouraged today. Let me pray. God, we are encouraged. What an encouraging word from you to cheer up, to take courage. And we can do that today because of the amazing truths that the Father loves us. The Father himself loves even me. What an amazing truth. That our belief in Christ as the Son of God is real. It's the real thing. Because we experience the love of the Father, we have direct access to Him and can run to Him at any time, calling upon Him, Papa, Abba, Father. Lord, all these, these truths, with the pinnacle truth that you've overcome the world, all the distress and the turmoil 
and the uncertainty that surrounds us day in and day out has been conquered. It's been defeated. And we are overcomers with you because we are in Christ. What amazing truth today. Lord, I do pray for your church that we would hold fast to these truths. Hold fast to our confession of faith, Lord. That's why we boldly approach your throne. We know these truths to be certain and true. Cement them in our minds, Lord. May we not waver. May we hold fast the great confession of faith. We love you. We thank you for these words of encouragement today. Let us take those to heart. We pray for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.